much of what I have to say is addressed largely to students, and there's a few of you in here that are not, so you will understand. Anyway, thank you for that introduction. I will tell you this, that we vacuum cleaner salesmen are rarely welcomed so warmly. <laughs> and uh, anyway, and to you students of this fine university, thanks for having me here. And I'm truly honored to address such a young audience. And I may say at my age, I, can, uh, I do say that to every audience. Uh, because my headquarters is in New Orleans, and my factory is in Long Beach, Mississippi, I've been asked to say a few words about Hurricane Katrina. And by way of a little background, uh, I, in 1945, I was flying bombing missions over Japan. After the atom bomb fell, uh, I saw the destruction firsthand at uh, Hiroshima. And I can tell you this, that the Gulf Coast looks like Japan looked. The, uh, dis the disaster defies comprehension. You've all seen the pictures, entire backgrounds, entire neighborhoods that are uh, vanished. Frankly, it will take years to rebuild. There were 250,000 homes destroyed, et cetera, a million people affected. Anyway, at the, during the storm, I was at my farm in Poplar River, Mississippi, which is about 100 miles north of the Gulf Coast, when Katrina hit. I was getting cabin fever uh, during the storm, and, uh, and all of a sudden it uh, stopped. Uh, there was no wind at all, there was no rain, the sun was coming out. I went outside thinking, great, this thing is all over. And uh, I no sooner walked, uh, I don't know, half a mile, I guess, but somewhere in an all hell broke loose. Those same people have been thank goodness, lost their job. The death toll. I'm happy to report, however, that every ORIC employee who had a job before the storm still has a job today. Many of our employees lost everything that they had, their homes, their possessions. It was our uh, aim to be a cornerstone of sanity in their lives, which meant that we had to get them back to work as soon as possible. And for a while, I didn't know uh, whether we had a business. Uh, fortunately, the tidal surge, which was more than 20 feet high wall of water, went inland only about five miles. Our factory uh, is five miles from the sea. And somehow or other, we dodged the bullet. We were high and dry. And uh, this factory, I may add, is 375,000 square feet, it's nine acres under one roof. And uh, but fortunately, somehow or other, we managed to survive that. Four days after Katrina hit, my son Tom, who was the president and CEO of the Orange Corporation, and his management team made arrangements to bring in portable housing, generators, food, water, doctors, nurses, and grief management counselors to aid our workers and their families. We are the biggest customer of UPS in the state of Mississippi, so UPS agreed to deliver supplies to the factory and then take truckloads of merchandise back to their hub in Atlanta. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, caravans of UPS trucks move back and forth through the devastation, carrying urgently needed supplies one way and auric vacuum cleaners in the other direction. <coughs> Excuse me. There was never an empty truck. We also brought in uh, tanker trucks filled with fuel. At one time, uh, FEMA confiscated our fuel trucks, uh, but we got through to the governor of Mississippi, who was really a good guy, and he got our fuel back for us. And 10 days after Katrina hit, the factory <coughs> reopened. We were the first company in the hurricane ravaged Gulf Coast to be back in business. We had only one assembly line working at the time, but what an emotional relief it was for everybody to have our people working again. The, uh, even folks that uh, who didn't work for work were heartened. If nothing else, we provided a great deal of hope to people and a great deal of despair. Meanwhile, our headquarters, which is in Jefferson Parish, New Orleans, 
also dodged the bullet, uh, as far as the storm is concerned. Jefferson Parish is one part of New Orleans that's on high ground, and our headquarters was fine. But New Orleans, as you know, was a disaster, and still is. We do a lot of business with IBM, so IBM gave us office space in Dallas with 150 workstations. This enabled us to relo relocate our New Orleans-based personnel and their families to Dallas. We paid all their hotel bills, since the only thing our people had were the clothes on their backs. We gave them vouchers to buy food and clothing. We, we bought them airline tickets so they could get back to New Orleans and take care of their personal needs which included everything from dealing with insurance companies to finding lost pets. It was chaos in Dallas, but at least it was organized chaos. And as I speak to you today, all of our people who were in Dallas are now back at work in New Orleans because we are primarily a direct mail company whose lifeblood is phone calls. Perhaps the single most important thing we did for our business was on the Friday before Katrina hit, we, we relocated our telemarketing center, uh, our call center, to Denver. Uh, had we not done that, we would have uh, had no phone service for months, and I'm not sure if we could have survived that. In my home in New Orleans, three and a half months later, we still do not have telephone service. There is an old advertising adage, when business is good, it pays to advertise. When business is bad, you've got to advertise. I'm sure you'd agree that Katrina qualified as bad, so we had to get our message out. But what do you say when so many lives are in shambles? In this case, we decided on two approaches. We placed two ads, the first in Time magazine and then USA Today, the second one in the People, Parade, Time, and Newsweek. The first ad, somewhere or other, I have a copy of. I mean, you can't see it very well out there, but I'll show you a piece of paper anyway. Uh, this ad, which was in Time Magazine, our headquarters is in New Orleans, our factory is in Mississippi. On August 29th, Katrina battered us, but did not break us. Today, 1,500 of America's best employees are back at work making America's finest vacuums. The first ad that we are back in business and to get people to contribute to the relief efforts uh, that were underway. Uh, the second ad uh, was an advancement of the first one. And it uh, looked pretty much like that. And it says, we're back on our feet again, but the Gulf Coast community isn't. Purchase an Auric vacuum and we will donate one in your name to people who are trying to rebuild their lives. These messages were also delivered through radio commercials. I'm a vacuum cleaner salesman, unashamedly. In all my years, this was the first time I didn't have to sell my vacuum to sell my vacuum. The outpouring of support from people throughout the country was absolutely phenomenal. Americans helping Americans get back to work has never made me more proud. I've received countless letters from people regarding our efforts to get the Gulf Coast whole again. Here's one from Phillipsburg, New Jersey, dated November 1. Dear Mr. Oreck, I've heard of your plan to help the families on the Gulf Coast try to recover from Hurricane Katrina. It is wonderful that you've been able to get your factory running again and have put people back to work. A return to normalcy and one of, it's one of the best avenues to recovery. She goes on, I have owned an Oric vacuum for many years. My mother, my mother-in-law and sister have all purchased Oric vacuums on my recommendation. <clears throat> we are all very satisfied. When I heard about your offer to buy a vacuum and you would donate another one to a family in need. We thought it was just great. However, we don't need another vacuum because my orc is working just fine. I have enclosed a check for $300, which is the cost of a new vacuum, plus donate a vacuum to two families. Oh no, correction. Please donate a vacuum to two families 
that have lost so much in the hurricane. Do not send one to me. You're doing a wonderful service to the people of this country. First and foremost, you still make your vacuums right here in the United States. I hope you're able to continue to do that forever. We also seek out products. We also seek out products made in the United States. And as you know, it's very difficult. May God bless you in the work that you do, do, not just making vacuums, but caring about your employees, neighbors, and friends. This country needs more businessmen like you. Respectfully, Mabel Cook. Pretty nice lift, don't you think? Friends, <clears throat> I think that it was uh, Martin Luther King who said that there is no nobler mission in life than to reach down and lift mankind up a little higher. I believe that Dr. King was right. You know, it's always humbling to be addressing the best and the brightest and the most dedicated students at the university level. While I've heard a few speeches in my time, when I look back, I can't remember who the speakers were or what they had to say. In fact, nobody that I talked to remembers the keynote speeches at the programs they attended. That's generally the part of the program where everybody's eyes glaze over. <clears throat> so I've asked myself, what can I possibly say to you in the remaining 15 minutes that will last you for the rest of your lives? Well, there is one thing. I make a great vacuum cleaner. <laughs> My amazing eight-pound Oric XL is incredibly light, incredibly powerful. It filters the air and cleans your floor. Dust stands in cat hair. Even dust mites don't stand a chance. Nothing gets by an Oric XL. I've been working on it for more than 40 years, and today I'm called an overnight sensation. I get letters all over the, all the time saying, your vacuum is better than advertised, or it's the best cleaning vacuum I've ever owned, or everyone should own one. We love it. All right. <laughs> I can hear you saying to yourself, oh God, hey Fedoric, what's he trying to do, sell us a vacuum cleaner? Well, I'll make this candid uh, confession. I'm always trying to sell my vacuum cleaner. But today, I'm not trying to sell you anything. The real message for the day is this. If I can do it, you can do it. I'm 82 years old. I came from a small town in northern Minnesota. I had no money, no name, no business, no factory, no distribution channel. Nobody wanted to handle <clears throat> an unknown brand. <clears throat> My uh, first warehouse was the back of a uh, rented 18-wheel tractor trailer up in Stamford, Connecticut. And today I'm one of America's most recognizable businessmen, so I've been told. And quite frankly, I've made more money than I ever could imagine. I've turned the Yorick name into a household name and put it on America's shopping list. I've got a factory that's nine acres under one roof, hundreds of stores around the country, and there are more than 1,500 people working for the Yorick Corporation. And for every person we hire at Yorick, 1.4 new jobs are created outside of Yorick. <clears throat> All this, and I didn't get into the vacuum cleaner business until I was nearly 40 years old. Which means you students have plenty of time to find your way. Good jobs are hard to find, you say. Well, yes, good jobs are hard to find. They're always been hard to find, but good people are even harder to find. You may have to move around a bit before you find the right fit, but You've already proven that you have the intestinal fortitude to, to uh, go the extra mile, or else you probably wouldn't be here today. So, don't panic when things look bleak and you're at your wit's end, which is a place we've all found ourselves at one time or another. Remember this, things are never as bad as they seem to the pessimist, and never as good as they seem to the optimist. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. The biggest mistake is not making a mistake. 
Don't be afraid to get fired. More often than not, they're probably doing you a favor if they tossed you out. Don't become a yes man or a yes woman. That's for politicians. On the other hand, don't become one of the no people. They drive me crazy. It's easy to say no. It's safer to say no. No is for people who lack imagination. Whatever the idea is, they say, let me tell you what's wrong with that idea. All right, you don't like my idea. What's your idea? I don't know, but yours is no good. I want to be around people who will find at least three things right with any idea before they find a million things wrong with it. You know, I gave my job everything I had. I worked very hard. I still go to work every day. I keep a pad by my bed at night and write down ideas in the middle of the night. Uh, I believe that if you all wanted instant notoriety, you wouldn't have come to college. Uh, you would have bought a bunch of uh, lottery tickets uh, hoping to strike it rich. My bottom line is this. Nothing replaces hard work. You know, Ted Williams was considered one of the greatest hitters in the history of baseball. His teammate, Dom DiMaggio, which was Joe's younger brother, said, Ted would come into the clubhouse after a game, put his fingertips on the floor, then get on his toes and do a hundred push-ups at a time, sometimes more, just so that he could strengthen his fingers, his wrists, and his feet. You know, when the best there is works that hard, then you better know that if you want to compete and you want to succeed, then you have to work every bit as hard so I would say this, uh, enjoy your summers off because uh, my young overachievers, after you get into the workforce, you get two weeks vacation a year if you take it. Uh, I went to college for one year. Then I found myself flying bombing missions in the South Pacific when the uh, B-29s, when the war was over, I moved to right here, to New York City. I chose New York because it was a business center of the world Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. If opportunity was going to knock anywhere, I figured my best chance was right here. I was never motivated by money. I wanted success, recognition, and respect. I knew the money would come. I didn't care if I was liked or hated. What I wanted was people to say, that son of a bitch is good. And while I didn't know it at the time, when I was working here in New York, I was working also on my master's degree. Only mine did not come from the classroom, but rather from sitting at the feet of the masters, people like General David Sarnoff. Sarnoff was a visionary. He founded RCA, the Radio Corporation of America. RCA brought the world television. One day, uh, Sarnoff took me to a meeting in Washington, D.C., where he was trying to convince the FCC that they should adopt the RCA color television system as the industry standard. It was a critical time for RCA. The FCC, by the way, said no. They decided on a system from CBS. And on the train ride back to Manhattan, General Sarnoff said to me, the FCC was capricious. I didn't know what the hell that meant, but I knew it wasn't good. <laughs> but Sarnoff's message was clear. He felt he had a better idea and was being treated unfairly. The CBS system simply wasn't compatible with anything else. Black and white TVs were blind when you transmitted in the CBS color. And the CBS color TVs were blind to black and white signals. And do you know how hard it is to get the government to change its mind about anything? Virtually impossible. But Sarnoff did not give up, and finally the government came around, and the RCA system is the one that's used today. And the lesson, in the immortal, immortal words of Winston Churchill, never, 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 never give up. Many years later, when I introduced my vacuum, the experts told me, too light, too light, Put some lead into it. People will never buy anything this light. 
a vacuum has to be heavy to clean. Fortunately, I didn't take their advice, but I did listen to them. What the experts were saying wasn't that my vacuum was too light, it was that customers felt that heaviness equates to cleanliness. Therefore, I decided to sell my eight pound vacuums to places with reputations for being clean, like luxury hotels. Hotels have to be clean. Hotels are constantly vacuuming 24 hours a day, seven days a week, year in and year out. Have you ever seen a dirty carpet at the Wall of Astoria or the Regency or the Windsor Court in New Orleans? Of course not. And to the consumer, that little old lady with varicose veins slaving away with her vacuum, if the eight pound Oric XL is good enough for a hotel, it's got to be good enough for her home. Frankly, I would have given my vacuums to the hotels just to say they use them. Because once I can tell the world that my vacuum proves itself in places where people are paying hundreds of dollars a night to stay, and it's so light it's a pleasure to use, then I was home free. And I might add, I've sold millions of eight pound Oric XLs all over the world, and I haven't put any lead in any of them. I learned from Sarah not to walk away from what I believed in. And I pass that along to you. I also suggest that wherever you go, search out the visionary, the entrepreneur. He or she will have forgotten more about business than most people will ever know. Selling to hotels is only part of my story. In the 1970s, one of the most popular carpets was an indoor-outdoor carpet called Ozite. The problem with Ozite is that it was glued to the floor, and the way conventional vacuums work, they had to pull air through the carpet in order to clean. So the floors of America were covered with dirty Ozite carpets. But I knew that my unconventional vacuum could clean them. So I went to their Chicago headquarters of Ozite, with two prototype, prototype vacuums under my arm. I approached the receptionist, whose desk was sitting on a filthy Ozite carpet. I said, um, can I see the president? She said, do you have an appointment? I said, no, you can't see him. I said, very well, uh, can I see the uh, sales manager? Do you have an appointment? No, we can't see him either. So I said, well, can I show you my vacuum? He said, oh, let's. And I plugged it in, and in one pass, I had the carpet clean. That receptionist ran in, and out came the president and the sales manager, and uh, they were astounded, and they said, you have the answer. Would you make a mailing to all of our distributors and dealers around the country? I said, would I? And I got about an 80% response. I sold so many vacuums, I had to call my brother and tell him to get another 18-wheeler up there. But what I really learned from the Ozite Corporation and the Ozite experience was that I could really reach customers by mail. And that's where I made my fortune. You never know where the road will take you. My most successful journey didn't start until my children were old enough to have children. There's no blueprint for what I did, no, no, no compass, no college course that teaches the Oric method. The real secret is this. There is no place in the world where I could have achieved this kind of success. America is where dreams come true. America is where you have the freedom to go to school and get your master's degree, the freedom to read, the freedom to work or not work, the freedom to succeed, the freedom to fail, the freedom to go to a doctor, the freedom to speak, to write, to criticize. There are people waiting, millions of people waiting all over the world to come to America, but there are no lines of people waiting to leave. A year ago, I got this email that I'd like you to hear. Someone in Pakistan had published in the newspaper an offer of a reward to anyone 
who killed an American, any American. So a dentist from Australia wrote the following in that newspaper to let everybody know what an American is so they knew, would know one when they found one. An American is English or French or Italian, Irish, German, Spanish, Polish, Russian, or Greek. An American may also be Canadian, Mexican, African, Indian, Chinese, Japanese, Australian, Iranian, Asian, or Arab, or Pakistani, or Afghan. An American may also be a Cherokee, an Osage, a Blackfoot, an Apache, or any one of the other tribes known as Native Americans. An American is Christian, or he or she could be Jewish, or Buddhist, or Muslim. In fact, there are more Muslims in America than there are in Afghanistan. The only difference is that in America, they're free to worship as each of them chooses. An American is also free to believe in no religion. For that, he'll answer only to God, not to the government, not to the armed thugs claiming to speak for the government or for God. An American is from the most prosperous land in the history of the world. The root of that prosperity can be, can be found in our Declaration of Independence, which recognizes the God-given right of each man and woman to the pursuit of happiness. An American is generous. Americans have helped out just about every other nation in the world in their time of need. When Afghanistan was overrun by the Soviet army, Americans came with arms and supplies to enable the people to win back their country. As of September 11, 2001, <coughs> Americans had given more than any nation in the world to the poor of Afghanistan. Americans welcomed the best, the best products, the best books, the best music, the best food, the best athletes but they also welcome the least. One national symbol of America, the Statue of Liberty, welcomes your tired and your poor, the wretched refuse of your teeming shores, the homeless tempest tossed. These are the people who build America. Some of them working in the Twin Towers the morning of September 11th, earning a better living for their families. I've been told that the World Trade Center victims were released from 30 other countries and cultures with first languages other than English, including those countries of the 911 terrorists. So, you can try to kill an American if you must. Hitler tried. So did General Tojo. Stalin, Mao Zedong, and every bloodthirsty tyrant in the history of the world. But doing so would be futile because Americans are not a particular people from a particular place. They are the embodiment of the human spirit of freedom. Everyone who holds to that spirit everywhere is an American. Ladies and gentlemen, time is the uh, one thing that we have plenty of and precious little of. Mine is power. Yours is just beginning. I have every reason to believe that if I can do it, you can do it, because you're the luckiest people in the world. You're living free in America. I wish each and every one of you the very best of luck.